oh, this person is from such and such a race, you know, this is probably what he's like, or these are probably his values, versus just treating each individual as a brand new person you've never met before and getting to know that person without any preconceived notions. That's the analogy, I think, in social sciences. Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by quantreasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at quantreasoning.com. I don't think about it at all. Uh, what I do is I read the question stem very, very thoughtfully as the very first thing that I do when the problem pops up on the screen, right? I go straight to the center of the screen to where the question stem is, usually in the center, and I read it very slowly and very thoughtfully so that I'm really clear on what my job is and what my job isn't. I think the right takeaway is, hey, a flaw in a plan has a lot more room to be the right answer than a weakness in an argument. Because plans could fail for all sorts of different reasons, and the reasons may or may not have been specifically mentioned in the paragraph. The correct answer choice could appear to be kind of out of the blue, because mm -hmm. nothing, nothing implied that that could be an issue in the paragraph itself, nevertheless, it's still a flaw in the plan. In fact, most flaws, if you think about just reality, usually flaws in plans are things that nobody thought about. If they had thought about it, then they would have changed the plan. Let me repeat to you what you said. You said, if I knew that it was a plan question, blah, 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 blah. But you could have known that it was a plan question just from reading the question stem very slowly and thoughtfully. You're a reasonable, educated, intelligent grown-up. So you know that plans fail for all sorts of unforeseeable reasons. So I think you just, I, I think it's probably actually a result of categorization. Like I think you memorized the takeaway from that other question about the hotel rooms. And that was the reason that you failed in this other question. I think that you had done too much prep, not not enough prep. Like I think the solution is to not be too rigid with supposed takeaways that you've learned in the past and treat each question as a brand new question, the likes of which you've never seen before, and just, you know, think. Think about it deeply. And then, and then I think that would have been avoided, that mistake. I don't think the answer is learning more question types. I think the answer is learning fewer question types and just treat each, each question as an individual as opposed to treating questions as members of groups. It's, it's a bit like uh, in social sciences, stereotyping different races and stuff like that. Oh, this person is from such and such a race, so he's probably, you know, this is probably what he's like, or these are probably his values, versus just treating each individual as a brand new person you've never met before and getting to know that person without any uh, preconceived notions. That, that's the analogy, I think, in social sciences. And by the way, same goes for really everything on the GMAT. I'm never trying to quickly figure out which bucket of categories or questions this falls into. I just treat it as a brand new question and I, I just have a very curious mindset. And I think that's the key. You all know, those of you who have been here for a while, you know that I'll always uh, rephrase a data sufficiency question as much as possible using the free info, for example. But I don't consider that a strategy I just consider that a habit. For everything on the GMAT, whether it's quant, verbal, or integrated reasoning, it doesn't matter. If your habit is to have an open mind, a curious mind, and your habit is to go very, very slowly through the information that is being provided to you, and not just slowly, but thoughtfully, like just doing a lot of thinking as you're reading it, then you don't need any buckets or strategies. I think buckets and strategies might be useful for people who are not very ambitious on the GMAT. 
All right, if your goal is 600, I can see the usefulness of trying to categorize questions, but I can also see it lead to a lot of unnecessary stress and anxiety to quickly, as quickly as possible, figure out which bucket this question belongs in. If you are very slow and deliberate and thoughtful in taking in the information, it will just become clear to you that it's, say, a weighted average question, for example. Or it will become clear to you that it's a question that's testing ratios, even though the word ratio doesn't appear there. They're saying this is 25% more than that. Okay, this is a ratio question, but I'm, don't go into the question with this pressure to categorize it. When I go into a critical reasoning question, I'm not going in feeling some kind of pressure to determine whether it's a weakened question or a strengthened question, thinking, oh, okay, if it's a weakened question, then let me recall from my memory what are the different strategies for weakened questions, but if it's a strengthened question, then I need to recall from memory some other kind of strategy. No, I don't do any of that, and I think it's a mistake to do that. Instead, I say, read the question slowly and thoughtfully, and do your job. This, all, this conversation started from uh, JD asking about the nuances between a weakened question, where you have to weaken the argument, and uh, identifying the flaw in a plan question. And he made a mistake on the identify the flaw in a plan question because he treated it the same way that you would treat a weaken the argument question. And he kind of categorized those in the same general category. And so my response to that was, don't learn that these are separate categories. Don't, don't add more ca categories and more buckets to your, to your studying. Get rid of the buckets and just read the question and read what is your job. Because if you had really thought deeply about, okay, my job is to identify a some kind of flaw in this plan, you wouldn't have made the mistake that you made. The reason you made the mistake is because you had memorized some strategy for a week in the argument question and then you applied it to this other question that doesn't exactly fit into that category. But the solution is not to learn more categories, the solution is to abandon categories and just think deeply about each question as it comes up. Hey, I'm just gonna interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. In general, I view uh, these test prep companies' material for uh, critical reasoning a little bit insulting for the students. Because uh, when you put into a book, do this when it's a weakened question, do this when it's an inference question, as a memorized procedure to apply and, and tricks to eliminate answer choices, etc., you're kind of saying, look guys, look students, we don't believe in you. We don't believe that you can reason through arguments in a, in, in a grown-up kind of way. So we're just going to give you these hacks and these tools to uh, categorize things into buckets because we don't believe in you and we've given up on you and you've given up on yourself. So here, just memorize these categories and, and just follow these mindless procedures in order to try to hack your way into the right answer. That's how I view it. It's insulting. And I think that it also does more harm than good. And I think that's the reason why, JD, you got that uh, identify the flaw question wrong, because you memorized some tricks for weakened questions, and then you applied them to this identify the flaw question. And I don't believe that any of us need that. And, you know, I go back to what Himanshu was saying about mm -hmm. how, uh, yeah, an inference question, also known as draw a conclusion question, requires a different strategy from, say, uh, weaken the argument question. And you're right, that's true. It does require a different strategy. But if you think about it, of course it requires a different strategy. Think about what the question is actually asking you to do. Do you really need a book to tell you that these question types are different and therefore require different strategies? Do you really need a book to tell you Hey, when you read the question, you better notice whether it's asking you to draw a conclusion or whether it's asking you to find the assumption that the author made in drawing his or her conclusion. Do you really need a book to tell you to pay attention to that difference and, and to then know which strategy to apply to which question? I don't believe that you do. I believe that you think that you do because you're not used to thinking deeply about questions. 
And of course, that's not your fault. That's the education system's fault, right? They give you uh, study I material and they say, you know, here are some questions from previous years. And you look at those questions and you say, okay, if I get that question, I do this. If I get that question, I do that. And then you show up at the exam and then you try to apply exactly the solutions that you saw in the test from last year to the appropriate questions. And it's, it's like a game of, you know, these are the five uh, different solution types. These are the five different question types. My job is to connect the right solution type to the right question type. And there's very little thinking going on there. So after 12 years or 16 years of, uh, of going through that kind of education, you get to the GMAT and you think, oh, I better get that book that tells me the, you know, these are the five question types and these are the five strategies. And then I just have to figure out which one goes with which. But it's impossible to do really well on this test with that approach, because things like what happened to JD will happen to you, where you say, okay, it's identify the flaw in a plan, but I don't know, from if my memory serves, I think that's basically very similar to identify the weakness in the argument, so I'll just apply that strategy, oh, this answer choice wasn't something that was mentioned in the argument, so I can eliminate it automatically without even thinking about it. And that's the problem. The minute you say, oh, I can do something without even thinking about it, then you're not thinking. And if you're not, I mean, how are you going to succeed on a test that's designed to measure your thinking if you're not thinking? Like really, the whole point of the GMAT is to measure your ability to think under pressure. That if I had to capture it in one sentence, that's what I would say. The GMAT's purpose is to measure your ability to think under pressure. So any strategy that's like a shortcut for thinking, or okay, you know, that way I don't have to think, well, what are you doing? You're, in a, you're on a test that's designed to test your thinking. Even when you're at home, don't try to identify which bucket or which category of questions this belongs to. Instead, practice thinking very deeply about what exactly this question is asking. And when I said to JD, hey, JD, identifying the flaw in a plan is different from finding a weakness in the argument. In what way is it different? Plans, almost by definition, fail because of some unforeseen reason some flaw that the planner failed to consider. So of course the correct answer choice isn't going to be something that was inside the paragraph. That's the whole point. If, if it was inside the paragraph, if the planner thought of it, then he wouldn't have missed it. He would have changed the plan to accommodate for that issue. So if you really think about it deeply, of course the correct answer won't be in the paragraph. And in weakening an argument, it may or may not be in the paragraph. It depends on the situation. Tonight, I'm going to drink too much alcohol. Therefore, tomorrow, I'll wake up hungover. So there are a lot of ways to weaken it. One weakener could have something to do with alcohol and hangover. But another weakener could be talking about a meteor shower that will end life on the planet. And a lot of people would eliminate that answer choice immediately because they'd say that has nothing to do with alcohol. It has nothing to do with being hungover. Nevertheless, it does weaken my argument because if life ends on the planet, I won't be hungover. Tomorrow morning, I'll be dead. So here's a, an answer choice that a lot of people would eliminate without even thinking about it because they read in some book that to weaken an argument, it has to have something to do with the argument. And they'd say, oh, this has nothing to do with the argument. Eliminate. No, it's actually the right answer. So think, just, you know, forget about books, forget about, like, it's, it's not testing content. Critical reasoning is not testing any kind of subject matter. It's testing your ability to think. So any book or any advice that's, helping you think less is going to push your score down. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.